Good evening. Hopefully you can hear me. I'll just wait to see how many we've got coming in. And then we'll go from there. I hope everyone is well tonight. In a second, I'll start just the introduction, but I'll just wait to see people come in, if that's all right. Fantastic. So I can see we've currently got three people watching, which is brilliant to start off with. But I just thought I'd start this evening and just summarize sort of our last live stream. So uh, obviously last time we watched uh, when we came together, it was talking about the Roman God series and talking about the Roman gods on Hadrian's Wall. This time round, we're going to be talking about some of the Anglo-Saxon videos I did over the coming months. We're going to be talking about Ad Geffrin, and alongside that as well, we're also going to be talking um, around, around about uh, the Hadrian's War Walk that I did earlier on in the, um, the month, so in early February. So uh, just to check, how is everyone doing? I hope everyone's doing well. Um, a couple of things to point out. Since last time, I have also set up a way of supporting me. So if you look in the uh, pinned message, I've set up a merch store and also a donation. So if you would like to do that, you can, but do not feel obliged in any way, shape or form. And alongside that, as last time, please feel free to put some questions in the chat. Let's get talking, ask questions, and we'll go from there. But uh, I think I'll just start off by uh, sort of summarizing some of the videos that have gone out recently. So I did a four-parter series, um, which covered about a fortnight, on the Anglo-Saxons. And we were looking at the Anglo-Saxons from the point of view of the mythology about the Anglo-Saxons. So we were looking at uh, Hengist and Horsa, early Anglo-Saxon myths, the migration, and also the British perspective with people like Gildas, who basically stated that the Anglo-Saxons came in, destroyed Britain, reduced it to nothing, and then because of that, the, um, the, the Dark Ages began as such. Um, then on the other hand, uh, we followed on from that, we started looking at the actual um, evidence so like for instance looking at the archaeology and we saw in the archaeology that actually sometimes Roman settlements were contemporary with buildings that we refer to as Anglo-Saxon so that's a really cool development right there you're seeing a transition from the Roman period into the Anglo-Saxon period a possibility of coexistence or like uh, that the, the Roman period didn't suddenly just end in 410 AD and then following on from that, we've also got the um, the final uh, sort of section, which was looking at, oh, sorry, the next one was looking at burials, DNA, and isotopes, which was a really, really fun video actually to do. And with the burials, fin, uh, the isotopes, and DNA, we were basically looking at the fact that the um, for a long time, archaeologists, when they looked at burials, they would say, well, the, the actual material in here says that someone was from this place, uh, this culture, and obviously because of the fact they're buried with this thing, this makes them a part of this particular group. And so that is a very interesting one to look at because when we're actually looking at this, um, the, the reality now is that we also have the science of isotopes and also the, the DNA. And those were absolutely fascinating because obviously isotopes, you can take someone's teeth if they are a child or an adult and find out the geographical location where they grew up. And then DNA is the really interesting one as well because it tells us our familial group, our familial um, sort of like connections and which of the various different uh, families of peoples from the world do we belong to. 
And so modern uh, DNA is actually showing that the British Isles, or at least uh, it's very interesting, a lot of the uh, studies are heavily focused towards the south and the southeast because of where burial sites have been found of the Anglo-Saxons. But those uh, DNA suggest that only 30% of the the English and the British Isles, so there is some Scottish, uh, well, so it's only in England for this one, but 30% of the English uh, DNA is actually um, Anglo-Saxon. So there's an interesting one right there. So um, basically those were the summary of the videos I did and it's basically just looking at that and discussing that initially. Um, ah, hello Noah, welcome, it's good to have you here. I think there is a slight delay, so if you are wondering at all when I'm chatting or anything like that, why I haven't responded to your messages, it's just because I'm dealing with the fact that there is a slight delay between what I'm sending to you guys and what is actually coming up on the live stream on YouTube. So uh, if you've got any questions, as always, put them in the chat and it'll be fantastic chatting to you all. Um, so that'll be great there. Ah, Ryan as well. Uh, good to see you too. Great to have you both with us. Um, so I don't know, did both of you get a chance to actually watch the episodes that I did um, earlier in the month? Or if you've been watching anything in particular lately that you'd like to ask me questions about or you've enjoyed, feel free to ask away. It's, uh, I'm more than happy to answer and have a look at that. And in the meantime, I'm trying to readjust my chair so I don't look like a hobbit. Ah. Yeah, yeah, the delays are usual. Um, and that should tell you how much of a delay we've got. I think it's about six seconds from what I've been able to tell. But yeah, the um, it's quite normal to have a slight delay on, on recording and stuff like that. Just on the water today, no beer in the uh, live stream. Um, mainly caused by situations. Ah, class. But yeah, um, sort of the stuff that really interested me about the videos I did lately um, was the um, the fact that you know when we're looking at Anglo-Saxon housing, for me, I'm I'm really interested in the fact that it could be, um, yeah, five second delay seems about right. Um, with the the Anglo-Saxons is that um, I'm I'm starting to want to look into this all a little bit more, and I've mentioned in my last live stream. Uh, you're welcome, Ryan. More than happy to reply. I do enjoy responding in the comments section. It's one of the biggest pleasures, actually, is to be able to chat to people and just see where it goes from there. But um, as I was saying, um, I think I mentioned in the last live stream, I plan to go back to university in September. So by going back to university in September, I'll hopefully have access to a lot more research, academics, groups like that. And it's something that I'm really interested in. But um, for me, I'm, uh, there's a big question in my mind of like, when when we think of like this change, this transformation into the Anglo-Saxon period, you know, is was it a lot more of the case of like at that period of time, it was just, um, there's just as much a need to do the change in the building materials. Because we think of Romans with their plastered stone built villas and stuff like that. But uh, there's a there's a really interesting one um, at Housted's Roman Fort in the fourth and early fifth century. So if you look behind me, one sec, use right hand, yeah, so right behind me, you can see Hadrian's Wall just going over the hill right here. And if you follow it along, you'll come to Housedead's Roman Fort, which is the fort in the center of Hadrian's Wall, fifth largest fort in Hadrian's Wall. Really, really interesting one. And when they were doing the archaeology, they found that instead of the barrack blocks being built with these large barrack blocks, which were just rectangular and then divided into subpartmentalized rooms, um, in the 4th and 5th century, it seems that they transformed into a slightly different thing. They transformed into what they have actually called chalets. And um, when they call them chalets, they're individually built buildings, not all of the same size, but side by side by side, all the way along. And the, the evidence for this would suggest that so many people thought, oh, they're individual family houses. I think, on the other hand, it's something more to do with building materials. And instead of having to cut down a huge, let's say, oak tree or a very large long tree to build a beam that goes all the way along all of the roofs of the barrack blocks, instead you just create a shorter one that can just go um, basically from the front to the back of the building instead of horizontally across all of them. 
and so that would therefore make it a lot easier to actually um, to construct these buildings and it's not actually a regression but instead a use of resources at that time because of a, a far less industrialized structure um, within the Roman Empire at that time because of the um, the obvious economic issues. So I'll just come to both your questions now. Uh, I wonder how much architectural design the Anglo-Saxons taken inspiration from the Britons and Romans in designing these not material. You're local to region near Hadrian's Wall. Your channel is often in that region. Will help me learn a bit. Yeah. So uh, Noah, I live in Newcastle, Newcastle upon Tyne. So um, often when you look at British history, it is heavily weighted towards the southeast of England, um, which isn't a bad thing. Um, obviously, you know, London and the southeast have their own history and uh, central England and all of that. The northeast has always kind of, or the north in general is often seen through the lens of wars with Scotland and stuff like that. There is some really interesting history up here. So my videos are generally aimed at bringing this to life. So in the future, I'd love to go down to York and do some videos in York. Um, alongside that as well, I'm keen to go uh, across and do some more stuff in Cumbria, Lake District. I want to get up to Scotland as well. Just try and cover as much of the north as possible uh, and tell stories that I find really interesting. Um, some of the stories I'm trying to, to get planned and filmed at the moment, I'm going to be doing a bit more Hadrian's Wall stuff to follow up my Hadrian's Wall walk that I did earlier in the um, in the year, uh, sorry, in February, earlier in February. Uh, but then alongside that as well, I'm also planning on filming on some castles and the Anglo-Scottish Wars. So looking at the wars between England and Scotland. Um, I want to maybe look at something like the Border Reavers, which is a band, well, bands of raiders that became very, very problem, big problem for both the English and Scots during the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. Um, even into the 18th, they were still, a, they were still, you know, quite powerful. Um, and then alongside that as well, I'm kind of interested in maybe doing some more prehistoric stuff again. Um, I do enjoy the prehistoric period, as you saw when I did my. Uh, Neolithic, sorry, uh, Mes Mesolithic, Neolithic, and Bronze Age uh, videos as well. Um, the other thing to point out is that while I'm talking, it's quite funny because uh, it's never going to be as polished as the videos because I can't edit out ums and ahs. So please forgive that. Um, here we go. Uh, look at the Midlands mostly. Ah, West Midlands. Uh, if you if you don't mind saying, don't worry if you do, but. Uh, happy uh, whereabouts and um, perhaps they took well uh, Bernard Cornwell huh. yes he's an interesting character I'll come to him in a moment yeah do you know any sources that support that he didn't just make it up so Bernard Cornwall is uh, he's a great historical fiction writer I personally don't like his stories uh, I don't like his character um, uh, that he makes out Uhtred the real Uhtred I find really interesting and I want to do some Anglo-Saxon videos on him and some more Northumbria ones, Bambra ones, all of that sort of stuff. But the actual TV series and book Uhtred I don't like at all. I personally think he wouldn't have survived very long in the Anglo-Saxon period and would have been executed by his king for being an absolute horrendous individual. But that's my own personal view. Um, so because of that I'm not a massive, massive fan of Bernard Cornwall. Um, though I think when he does his design, he does know his stuff, he does know his history. So when he's describing the buildings, I, I have no problem with that. Um, when we're looking at Anglo-Saxon architecture, you have to understand that they did build their own buildings. So my Ad Geffren series, I'm going to be talking about some amazing structures that were at, at Ad Geffren. There's a, band st uh, sorry, a grandstand which sat up to 320 people, they reckon. Uh, there was a number of great halls, huge, huge halls on the site, and then alongside that as well, not only were the great halls and the band, uh, the grandstand, but there was also seems to be a giant cattle corral or like a giant um, location for storing cattle. Um, which again, the debate is: is it British or is it Anglo-Saxon? The problem is that is that the archaeologist in question, um, Brian Hope Taylor, didn't do any carbon dating. Uh, carbon dating was really new at the time when he had just come into it and so he just didn't bother and unfortunately uh, the wood that he did save has been lost over time in university stores um, so new new digs need to be done on the site see if they can find some of the wood and if they can carbon date any of the site uh, because it's just 
it's a bit of a frustration, but it would give us a really interesting view to find out whether or not the site was um, British or, um, or Anglo-Saxon or how it was being used. Um, really like and unrealistic. Yeah, um, again, the paganism isn't the problem, I think. The hostility towards his king, yeah, freaking problem. The paganism is an interesting one. Because um, I'm not entirely sure how how hostile the Anglo-Saxons actually were to Anglo-Saxon paganism. It's something I really need to look into. I know that you know um, later on we look at the Dane law. There was like um, you know a, a general tolerance towards uh, paganism initially, but then we see that actually. A lot of Scandinavians, and this is something that is sometimes people who are neo-pagans find a little bit difficult, they actually converted to Christianity really quite quickly. Um, they actually amalgamated and their cultures mixed in together with the Anglo-Saxons a lot faster than people um, would uh, like to think. You know, you're looking at 50 to 100 years and by that point they were very, very integrated. And so you have this new Anglo-Danish culture. You also have to think as well that those cultures were far more connected because, you know, in a week you can cross the North Sea. You can be, you know, quite far up Norway. You can be into the Baltic. Um, these people were trading long distances and they knew each other quite well. And we have possible evidence for Norwegian uh, settlement from either isotopes of DNA in Northumbria during the... Um, during the, uh, the the sixth century and seventh century as well, or at least also as well through fashion. There's good evidence for a specific type of uh, Norwegian brooch that um, ended up in Northumbria during maybe about the 650s. So possible that's been for either as a trade or as a possible migration again to the region. But again, more DNA, more research needs to be done. Uh, welcome to the people, by the way, who've just arrived. I'm just watching the watch count and just see that a couple more people have joined us. So welcome. If you'd like to chat away, it's always good to hear and it's good class to chat away. Um, yeah, so a really good one, though, to look at. There's a reenactment group called uh, the Thanes of Mercia. Um, one second, I'll see if I can find them. Uh, you can't see what I'm doing, so I do apologize if it looks at all confu confusing. Um, Fanes of Mercia. And they are big, big advocates for um, sort of Anglo-Welsh settlement in the West Midlands. And that the West Mid Midlands was far more um, Anglo-Welsh than people give it credit for. Yeah, so that's that's them on Facebook if you at all are on there. But uh, there's uh, there's very good evidence for mixing, um, and that the Anglo Welsh culture in that region was incredibly strong. Um, so yeah, if you're interested at all in that, definitely have a look at the um, the Thanes of Mercia because they they represent the West Midlands and the Anglo Saxon period, and their kit is brilliant. Um, I always butcher this other reenactment group's name. And if there's anyone who knows how to pronounce it properly in the chat, please correct me. But Wolfendias, um, uh, they represent uh, Vendel and uh, Sutton Hoo. So in, in the early, um, early Middle Ages in um, southern Sweden, there was the Vendel culture. And uh, it seems that the guy who was found in the Sutton Hoo burials, who we presume... Um, yeah, Clans and Dynasty, very good. Um, lovely to have you here, as always, and thank you very much. Um, but yeah, the uh, the Vendel king seemed to have influenced the Sutton Hoo king, who we presume is uh, Regwald of East Anglia. Again, it's not certain, but we think it's Regwald. Um, and the, the Vendel culture, they, they are the most famous ones when you think of um, Anglo-Saxon uh, artifacts because of the Sutton Hoo helmet, the shield, the sword, but actually when you compare it to other English culture, there's um, some some cross um, some differences between like what you see as Vendel and what we see as Anglo-Saxon. No bother, Noah. I'm happy to if if I know something and then I'll try and always share it. 
because the, the more people who know about stuff, the better, because there's some amazing stuff out there, but it's, it always ends up being quite niche. Um, and I think the more and more people know about stuff, the better it is. Glad to hear the kids are in bed. Uh, I think if at the start of the stream, you may or may not have heard, but uh, my wee one was protesting in the background and she is now hopefully having story time. Uh, no, no, so uh, Grendel is the demon or the monster in Beowulf, or Beowulf. Um, Vendel, uh, with a V, uh, is the Vendel culture. So one sec, Vendels. Uh, the Vendel um, culture, Sweden, Vendel period, one moment, so that's the Vendels, uh, forgive Wikipedia articles by the way, they're just so much easier to share, but Wikipedia is always has a little bit of um, it, it's not the best academic source, basically, so always just keep that in mind. Uh, and then um, the other one is Wolfendas, or Wolf, Wolfendias. Uh, oh. You'll understand why I'm struggling to pronounce it when you see it. And you'll be like, oh, Alex just isn't struggling here. There we go. So yeah, Wolfendas is the really famous Swedish, uh, sorry, um, Anglo-Saxon reenactment group, well, Vendel reenactment group, but everyone calls them Anglo-Saxons. Uh, the Vendel period, yeah, uh, no, so no, Van, you said Vandals. Uh, so there's Vandals and Vendels. Um, Vandals are a, um, I think they came from Scandinavia, but they ended up settling in Spain and southern France and formed a large um, kingdom of Aryan Christians. Um, I think that's the Vandals. Uh, Vandals. Uh, and, they also, so, and they also settled in, no, the Vandals settled in North Africa and were uh, Germanic peoples who I think came from Scandinavia um, originally, but again, that's a period I'm a little bit rusty on, so please fact check that. The Vandals are a culture in Southern Sweden two different groups, but yeah, Vendels and Vandals, uh, because of the fact that the V and W sound come from the migration period, it's quite cool. Um, why, which is why English would know about the Beowulf story, in fact, I think that Anglo-Saxon warriors were geet, mercenaries, the geets. Yeah, so Vandals did go to North Actor, Ryan, sorry, I do apologize if I've made any confusion at all. Uh, the Vandals went to North Africa. Uh, well, the non warrior Anglo Saxons are civilian, no worries. No, I think that's a wee bit, um, I wouldn't say that's right. Um, so, the gets, um, from what we can tell, uh, there's one theory at the moment that actually Beowulf was written in Northumbria, in Hexham Abbey. Um, it was an oral story, but when you look at the landscape described in Beowulf, it's not Denmark. Uh, Denmark is flat as a pancake. Um, it's a very, very low-lying flat land, um, whereas um, when you look at the landscape described in Beowulf, it's a lot more similar to Northern England. And so we think that it may have been a story written down in Northern England in the monastery, possibly Hexham Abbey, as almost like a, um, an additional resource. So monks could be given private commissions by uh, private individuals. And Beowulf is kind of like the blockbuster of the day. So I'm, I'm trying to think of a really good example, but if you think of like a, a really big, I'm, I'm gonna make a sort of a, an allegory to modern age, but think of it as like someone self-financing like a new Ghostbusters or a new Spider-Man film. And so they hire a, a film studio to do it. In a similar way, these private Northumbrian lords maybe had their fame, favorite stories, and what they would do is they would hire monks to then go and to write them down, and so that's how we have the versions of Beowulf. Um, and I think that's that's a, quite a theory that I sort of stick by, um, because there's a lot of underlying Christian allegory in um, in Beowulf. It's it's not a pure pagan story. It's very much a Christian story using the lens of um, a Germanic pagan 
to to actually tell a story and I, I touch on that actually in the April Fools video um, I'm gonna release on the first first of April um, which will which will be fun I hope you'll enjoy it it's uh, something I'm working on in the background I quite enjoy uh, so I'll just catch up um, Warren my fear Yeah, yeah, so uh, the Gets are in Sweden, yeah, um, but um, Beowulf is operating in southern Sweden and Denmark. So Beowulf is a Get, I believe, and he travels across to Denmark to kill King Hrothgar. Um, again, I'm a wee bit rusty. I will try and remember it better. Leonard, ah, great job, Alex, on the video, and thanks again for sharing. Also, thank you for the link early last week. Cheers, mate. You are welcome. I hope that your equestrian is equestrian, or are you doing a cavalryman? I didn't fully understand from your message if it was an equestrian rank, or if it was actually a, a, a late Roman cavalryman, because that is massively cool, and I look forward to seeing photos when you're willing to share, because um, it is a hard thing to do a cavalry impression. They are glitzy uh, soldiers. I just do bog standard infantry, and already I know that it's a it's ex expensive hobby, but I absolutely love it. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing your uh, your cavalryman, or if you're doing an, a knight, an equestrian, that that's going to be even better. Um, and you might want to speak to Ives in Switzerland in the late Roman group, uh, or um, what's his name in Spain? You have um, I can see him, Iago. Iago in Spain or Yves in Switzerland are both cavalrymen and they do some fantastic impressions. Uh, Iago does more um, early impressions, so he's like first, second, uh, whereas Yves does a third century uh, impression as well. I don't think I'm specifically right. Flaws in my theory, obviously. Yeah, don't worry, we're all learning, so don't worry, no, in what, any way, shape, or form. Always, always learn, and it's always better to learn than not. One of theories in the translation. Yeah, likeness towards uh, Northumbrian thing. That's the thing about Beowulf is that you know people think that these stories just because they're set in one place, you know, um, you know, just doesn't mean they were written there. Um, they they they're allegories so often, and so like um, for instance, when we're looking at stuff like Gildas, the angry monk, he's probably writing in Wales because all of the kings he mentions are actually Welsh kings. And when they're Welsh kings, you know, he's he's having a go at Welsh kings, he's having a go at what they're doing, and he's just like, well, you know, you know, the whole world's fallen apart, but is it just a specific image on Wales at that time, or is it, you know, that he's just creating a hyperbole, or is he using biblical allegories? Because obviously, you know, the um, when you look at the Bible in the Old Testament, the sin of the people of Israel then resulted in them being taken over by the Philistines and also by other nations around them within the storyline that they were telling, uh, which is obviously a religious story. Now, when you think of it in a similar way, these monks are influenced by the Bible. So when Gildas is saying the entire world's fallen apart, he may be reflecting a, uh, a spiritual failing on the part of the Britons and therefore is using an, uh, a similarity with the Old Testament that people would recognize. And so that's the wise writing. And then so obviously when it's discovered in the 19th century and translated, you know, everyone takes it as literal history because they're so used to the history that they're writing where facts and are becoming more important, more important, because obviously even in the 19th century, history was, um, we're still coming to to what we'd more recognize today as the sort of empirical understanding and study that we we, we really focus on now. Uh, whereas, you know, obviously, uh, he still had some very strong um, nationalist, racialist, and, um, <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to think, all the other ists in the 19th century in the historical writing that you've got there. It's very fun uh, to take it apart. Uh, Anglo-Saxon forces compare themselves with the Canaanites and the Israelites in the Bible. Yeah, it's a good point. Bede, actually. Uh, so Bede is my primary source for the Ad Geffren series that's currently going out. So obviously on Monday, the next episode will go out. But the Ad Geffren series, Bede is the one who mentions it and he calls it a royal villa. And when he's talking about the various kings, obviously Edwin, King Edwin of Northumbria, is, is a Catholic. And when he's a Catholic, Bede is a Catholic. So obviously Edwin is his favourite. 
Oswald is a heroic king and everyone loves Oswald but he's a Celtic Christian so he is um, he wouldn't be under the the sort of the Catholic bank blanket that uh, Bede even though he respects Oswald a great deal he can't he has to sort of hold up Edwin a wee bit higher than Oswald because he's Catholic rather than Oswald following the the Christianity that uh, was the possibly the older version that survived past the Roman Empire and was mixed in with uh, the traditions of the local people. Not that there was much difference between Celtic Christianity and Catholic Christianity other than the dating of Easter and the monk's haircuts, but that's sort of what was going on. And so when you've got that going on, you've also got to think that Bede and um, when he's, he's holding up Edwin, he actually also has to sort of talk about Oswald's father, Elthwith, and Elthrif is, is it, it, I look at him and he's just amazing. He's an absolute monster of a king and he manages to conquer a huge amount of what is modern day England and southern Scotland. And But uh, he's a pagan. Um, when he's a pagan, Bede has to reconcile this. So he uses the example of King Saul and he uses the same words that the Bible uses to describe King Saul to describe um, to describe uh, Elthrif. So again, he's using the example that Aelfrith is God's tool of judgment as a pagan, but is not saved himself. So again, all of these are from an understanding of biblical history. Um, and so we have to take the history not as empirical, but as a spiritual story as much as it is a historical story. I'm just catching up. Uh, the Anglo-Saxon well, the downsides of being an atheist so can be pretty difficult to understand what Gilders and Bede refer to. Yeah, it again. Um, so obviously, I, I'm open about the fact I'm a Christian. So I've studied the Bible, but at the same time, don't worry about it because uh, there's a lot of Christians who don't necessarily read the Bible as much as they should, or even understand it within the historical context. Because you know, when you're reading these stories, they're also reading it in a very different way. Because obviously interpretations of the Bible have changed over the centuries. Um, I think modern theologians might be a little bit uncomfortable in the way sometimes Bede and Gildas utilise the Bible. Just as Bede and Gildas, if they saw the way modern theologians did, would sometimes be a little bit, uh, well, they, they would be uncomfortable as well with the, some of the modern interpretations. So it's, it's um, you have to understand it within the historical context and often picking up copies of like uh, the Ecclesiastical History of the English Peoples or a publica publication version with an editorial um, script reference is very helpful because they'll be able to explain the, the, the biblical allegories they're using. Uh, one second, uh, I'm just catching up. Romanticist is the word you were compared to. Ryan, I'm um, just so I understand the hyperbole. Uh, yeah, be comparing about haircuts and the dating of Easter. He didn't stop ranting. He's, he's not as bad as a rant, but he does. It, the haircuts are quite important. Um, so the interesting thing, uh, some of the interesting things when you look at Anglo-Saxon Christianity, uh, first of all, when we look at Celtic Christianity, the haircut of the monks, the tonsure, is interesting because um, many people think that the monk's tonsure actually comes from a sort of a willing uh, removal of yourself from the military community. So obviously um, young men, uh, on in general, unless you have incredibly high testosterone, um, will have um, hair on your head. Uh, but um, as you grow older, some people have uh, male pattern baldness. And so when you have male pattern baldness, you start to lose your hair. So the tonsure, the monk's haircut, is the concept is that you are removing yourself from the fighting population. You're willingly choosing to become an old man. In, 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 um, so the, the allegory is that you are choosing or becoming a part of the non-fighting population. And so the tonsure was to represent you no longer were a warrior, you would not take up arms, but instead you would join a different spiritual army. You would join the kingdom of God and therefore your weapon was prayer, you know, caring for people, all of the, the acts that you see that were the values, the Christian graces. And so the difference between the Celtic tonsure and the tonsure of the Catholics was the Celtic tonsure went across ear to ear and then forwards. So it's kind of like you cut your hair from about here, from ear to ear, down, and then the back of your head would still have hair on it. 
whereas the Catholic tonsure is the one you're probably more used to from film, TV, and also seeing modern day monks, which is at the back here, which is traditionally when you think of, you know, guys who have early male pattern baldness, their baldness starts here. And then um, when you see that, you know, that's when you get sometimes people doing comb overs or stuff like that. And so it's the two different styles of haircut. <clears throat> Uh, so it's sort of the, the removing yourself from the military community and dedicating yourself to a life of God. Is that what is uh, what the tonsure is? Um, <laughs> yeah. So the and um, the the other interesting stuff about it is looking at stuff like um, <clears throat> not just haircuts. So oh, by the way, hello to everyone who's arrived. It's uh, nice to see the numbers we ticking up. But if you have any questions, as always, just put them in the uh, the chat and happy to chat about things. Or if you've got any questions about any of the videos I did, the Hadrian's Wall walk I did earlier in the month, anything like that, I'm just happy to chat to everyone. So just um, just do that. Um, but yeah, those those are the interesting ones there. Um, other interesting one is the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, when you come to hairstyles. You're looking at stuff later on with the Anglo-Saxon versus the Norman hairstyle. So the Anglo-Saxons sported generally uh, longer hairstyles. We have a possible reference, and this is what the TV show Vikings, they go to town on. But they suggest that the Danes wore their hair forwards, almost like so it would uh, cover your eyes. So it was like your hair would come down forwards like this. And then that possibly... Um, then results in the Norman haircut that you can see so well in the um, Bayeux tapestry. Because the Normans, uh, even though they descended from Scandinavians, seem to be, uh, they, they're very, very religious. Like very deeply, deeply religiously Christian. Um, and obviously at the period there wasn't a problem with like dedicating yourself to war and all of that sort of stuff. But what they did is they did a sort of reverse tonsure where they shaved almost like a bowl haircut all the way around the back of your head but left the top hair on. And so it's almost like the Normans were dedicating themselves with a military reverse tonsure uh, to represent their martial style. The other possibility as well is the um, is that the, um, the haircut was to just help with putting on helmets and weapons and stuff like that. Uh, Ryan, earlier you mentioned Border Reavers. We talked about that before, but it's a lack of good videos about them. Yeah, so the problem is is that a lot of the books on the Border Reavers are quite hard to read. So I've got one that's written in uh, a version of English that is just, it's very difficult for me to get my head around. It's written in, uh, in a dialect. And so the problem with that is it's, it takes a long time to get through it and it's very confusing but I am going to put more time and effort into trying to make some really good videos on the Border Reavers because there was 70 to 80,000 some people estimate Border Reavers by the time that the, um, the, the, they were removed, they were cleared out of the land and sent off to places like Australia, America or they were told to move to the cities like Newcastle and Carlisle and Reaver surnames, you'll, um, you'll, uh, you'll know some of the Reaver surnames so like Armstrong, the first man on the moon, uh, Nixon, Gray, Turnbull, um, Oliver. I'm descended from the Oliver clan myself. Uh, but there are many uh, Border Reaver clans. And those Border Reaver clans are the ones who are really interesting. And so I, I, I feel that they deserve a couple of videos because, as you say, there's not really anything on YouTube worth worth anything. And just it's really frustrating to try and do it because... Um, Another group, the, uh, the Robsons, they actually organized a horse stealing ring that meant you could, whenever a horse was stolen between like, a, you know, London right the way through to north of Scotland, they, they, were, they were involved in it somewhere along the line. So you're looking at some really interesting characters um, and, you know, famous for busting out of jail, running around the place, causing all sorts of bother and holding both England and Scotland to ransom. So really, really cool character. Well, it's cool characters to study. If you met them, though, they're, they're horrendous, <laughs> horrible human beings. Uh, there's uh, there's some terrible, terrible stories that I'll save up. But like the Robsons, they they were they were full on. It's just some pretty horrendous stuff to their enemies. And there's some Border Reaver Bastel houses and places like that that still exist. And I really want to tell their story a wee bit more. Um. 
Johnson and Beetle in my family tree. Yeah. Well, the thing is, it's like, again, lots of our family trees are very romantic. Um, you know, it's cool to know who you come from. Ultimately, you as a person is more important because uh, recently, like I did my genetics and my family tree, but um, I've, I've met a lot of people online who put far too much weight on their genetics and their family tree and not enough on personal character. Uh, so it's kind of put me off, um, you know, looking more into family tree and genetics. Because even though it's interesting, you know, those people yeah, I've never met, I, they never shaped me other than shaping my family culture. So I always, I always find that a wee bit more tricky. Um, okay, the 300 Reaver families, very few were clans. I may have to swap notes as I have a video on the clans coming up soon. When I say Reaver clans, uh, basically I use the word family and clan interchangeable clans and dynasties. Um, just simply because of the fact that like, um, when you're thinking about it, the Reaver clans and dynasties, there's a... Uh, they, they married into each other, so there weren't Scottish Reavers and English Reavers, there were Reavers. You know, you married your distant cousin, or, you know, your distant cousin, you know, was a cross on another family, and then you married, you know, another family member from a different Reaver clan, and they all came together. Um, I'll see if I can find a good image, actually. Uh, So this is great page, England's Northeast, and I actually know the guy who runs it, but he's got um, a huge page on the board of Reavers, and if you scroll down, he's actually got uh, some of the Reaver families, and uh, he actually has a, um, you can buy a map of all of the, be the, the Reaver, um, Reaver families and where they lived on his other page, Tangled Worm. Just finding that now. Please, uh, please wait. That's the one. Uh, there we go. Um, yeah, there's the Reaver clans across in um, yeah it's a really good website um, he does a fantastic job and he's really in-depth and uh, Tangled Worm his other site obviously you can buy mugs and prints and all that stuff but his Reaver um, family surnames I actually have it over here um, on the side and it's just a fantastic use a resource right there um, yeah, yeah. Happy to do so. Let's, let's organize a chat soon because I think there's a couple of videos we can do together and I'm still up for doing that Crusader Kings um, playthrough with you guys because I think that'll be a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, so that was that's the sort of thing right there is you've got um, all sorts of stuff that would be fun to do. I want to do some more on this, the, the castles of the Northeast as well because we've got such a high density of castles really huge density and um, I want to go out and film some more around castles and talk about the Anglo-Scottish War because like the thing is is that in that early period that's sort of 11, 12, 1300s you know it was I'd, I'd almost the aristocracy I'd describe as Norman I wouldn't describe them as English or Scottish that's modern terms we're putting onto them so the thing is is that uh, there were Norman lords ruling over Scotland, there were Norman lords ruling over England, and then they just battered the living daylights to, out of each other to secure more land. You know, you look at the Bruces, the Bruces originally, they came from uh, Teesside in the northeast of England, their ancestry originally, Norman French, they had lands in Teesside, but then they were granted lands up in Scotland, and then eventually they became to the point where the Bruces became uh, a royal family of Scotland. But they're Normans, but they learnt the Gaelic language, they, they culturally assimilated, so they called themselves Scots, which is really fascinating. You know, it's like these Normans, the, the, the Scandinavians, the Vikings, everyone always thinks of them as coming over and going, oh, we must worship Thor and we are all Vikings here. No, 
No, they are some of the most culturally flexible people. You look at the you know the settlements, the you think about the Vangarian Guard. Within a generation, those guys would have been Greek. You know, they, they settle in the Dane law, they become Anglo you know, Anglo Saxons or Northern English. You know, they settle in Normandy, they become as French as the French, Norman French. You know, settle in Sicily, they they are amazingly plastic, and I mean that in the uh, the sense. They're such an interesting people, the Scandinavians at that time, because they, they culturally amalgamate much more than people like to imagine. Um, do you do Discord chats? I need to set up, I have a Discord, uh, and I need to figure out how to use it properly. Um, I'll see if I can find the link to my Discord, because I, I should get to use it better. I silenced my other one, I'm in a couple of other Discords, uh, and I don't know how to use it properly. Um, so would you be patient with me on that one? I'll make a note and let me um, let me set up a discord because it's something that I I do have as a promise for my patrons and stuff like that and I need to figure out how to use it better because I am um, as much as I'm technologically you know pro using new technology sometimes I find it overwhelming to find out how to learn a new thing because like I've obviously had to learn how to do video editing filming all that stuff then finding out all the new socials, it's it's something new. But I'll get there. I'll get Discord up and running and we'll do that. Um, the Northumbrian borderlands have always been brutal, starting from the Romans. Ah, yes and no. The Ro yeah, there, there, there was elements of peace when the Romans had killed everyone. Christian Vikings, especially later on. Yeah, there is. Uh, one of my favourite ones is... a. a a saint of the Hebrid Orkney Islands, I think, um, who, he was a Viking and he, he turned to the Christians. He said, what's the highest rank that you can be as a Christian? And they were like, oh, a saint. And he goes, I want to be one of those. And so he gets baptized and he becomes a living saint. Just it's hilarious. Such, you know, in that period, he just said, oh, I'm a saint now. And everyone's just like, that's not exactly how it works, mate. And he's just like, no, no, I'm, I'm a saint. <laughs> just... <laughs> Brilliant, you know, it's just like total misunderstanding of Christian theology, total and utter disregard for what it might mean, and he just says, "No, I'm a saint now," and he goes off to the Holy Land and he fights in the Holy Land, gets baptized in River Jordan. I probably think he was a very committed Christian, but totally didn't understand it initially. Very interesting character. Um, who is he? Uh, I think it's Olaf of Orkney. I need to remember properly. Uh, to find it but uh sorry about that but there is one like that um but yeah no, like some it's very interesting to look at it but uh the, this period of history like um so each of the different periods i find so interesting for so many different reasons so like for instance um i love the prehistoric because we're trying to figure out what was going on it's it's such a mystery um, because we don't know their language, we don't know their culture. Um, like, for instance, if we think about it, uh, the Bronze Age population of Britain became the Celts, or what I use Celts, because they're not they're not truly Celtic, um, in the the sense that you know people think of a, a Celtic culture, culture stretching from Poland right the way through to Spain and Ireland. Um, each of those cultures was far more individualistic and broken down than people realize. But the, um, the, the Celtic um, peoples of the British Isles came from the Bronze Age. They were that beaker people migration. And then like when the Romans invade, obviously, bam, you get these uh, really interesting transition. This new, amazing new just changeover. And when you get this changeover, um, you know, we lose the Brothonic language. We uh, the Brothonic peoples don't seem to write any of their history down. So, like anything before forty three A.D., it's very, very questionable as to what we know. And so, like looking at it, like my interest at the moment is uh, 
There are roundhouses and there are palisade enclosures. I'm reading loads on Northumbrian archaeology and we can look at the different types of roundhouse, the shapes, the palisades shapes, the hill fort shapes, the lowland forts, because they're now discovering there were just as many lowland forts as there were upland hill forts. Um, palisade enclosures, hill, the, the round houses that they had, all of that sort of stuff. But um, even though we've got all of those sort of things in the ground and we can see them, you know, um, we barely know anything about them because they, they don't have much material culture or they haven't been excavated much. And I think there's a disproportionate weight because of the fact that people find uh, find the Romans much more sexy <laughs> because they've got their nice stone and their, you know, their, their, their artifacts and they chuck way more stuff away or they lose a lot more stuff. They have a lot more material culture and so it's okay for them to lose it. Uh, whereas it seems that, you know, we've got a period much longer you know, from 2500 BC to 43 AD, you know, but a lot less material culture. There's some beautiful bronze stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, Ryan, there's so much more. And with new science, like I said, isotope DNA, carbon dating, uh, 3D scanning. 3D scanning, I think, is one of the things that in archaeology is going to be so exciting because what we can do is um, we can make things open source for the first time ever. You know, it, like you don't have to wait for the document to be published. What you could do is you can do a dig. Let's say you find something. You 3D scan it on site, upload it to like whatever cloud, Google Drive, whatever you're using. And then someone, while you're sleeping, could analyze it in the United States or uh, in Australia or in, in another part of the world and then you get up in the next morning you can read their reports write notes back and then continue digging there's a whole new way of doing archaeology that no one has even thought about yet but it could mean that like nations let's say for instance the departments in the USA where they want to study Roman or um, Bronze Age or stuff like that a European Bronze Age or Roman artifacts, they can't access it because, you know, as we know, the Romans never got to the United States or to the North Americas. So because of that, they could actually analyze it overnight and have access to real finds, real time. You know, we're living in, we live in the future, so it's cool. We, we can look at this stuff and it's really like exciting. And you can tell how excited I am because the thing is like, you know, now the world is flat. You know, we can send in a text message to someone or an SMS, depending on which one you use, to someone on the other side of the planet. It's brilliant. Anyway, you know, that's that's me. Um, that's me geeking out. So uh, apologies about that. You just saw me just go a wee bit wild there. But that is my uh, that's one of my dreams is to look at how we can use technology. And yet at the same time, I struggle with discord. So go figure. Um, <laughs> But th that's the way my mind works. Um, I think stuff like that is really cool. But yeah. Um, does anyone have any questions about the Hadrian's Wall Walk or anything like that? Or uh, just to, I know it's mostly Noah and Ryan, but if the other people watching would also like to drop questions and happy to answer any questions or stuff like that and uh, just see how it goes. And I see a couple of people have joined us. So uh, if you've got any questions as well, feel free to answer. Yeah. It's fun to geek out. Thanks, Noah. Hey. Mm. Don't worry, it's only water. If anyone just saw me down that there. Hopefully, the people who have just joined us won't disappear, but it's been one hour, so what I'm gonna do is just take a one minute break, okay? To grab some more water, just because my room I'm working right now is quite hot with uh, the computer and the uh, heaters on. But then I will be about, um, I'll be back. And Linda, I have seen your question and I will uh, talk about those in a moment, but I will be back in one moment. So just do not worry, I will be back.
there we go, he's back. So, Lowland Forts. Um, about your recent videos of gods. Cool, cool. I'll look at that in a second, Ryan. I'll answer that question in one moment. So, Lowland Forts. Uh, basically, for a long time, people just thought that the uh, Britons only had encampments in the lowland areas. But aerial photography and LIDAR is now producing loads of evidence and it's really really good evidence as well for lowland enclosures. Now these lowland enclosures are similar to hill forts and there's a number of different varieties. So you have either a single palisade around three or four buildings um, in a lowland area or you have a double palisade. Um, you can also have palisades and ditches, or you can have a, a box, I've, I've got the correct term, but a box palisade. And what happens is you have these two uh, palisades side by side, and then they would form a box over the top and fill the inside with, uh, with earth, and then that would go all the way around the enclosure. Um, and so you have these different types of lowland fort. The only thing is, is that, to my knowledge, none have been excavated. Um, and so it would be really interesting to actually excavate some of the lowland enclosures or lowland forts. Because they have sometimes where places where they found singular roundhouses or stuff like that. The other thing as well is that the period of hill forts seems to come to a very dramatic end around about three to 300, maybe 400 BC. Which is really, really interesting. Because the, the hill forts just seem to be abandoned and they leave them and they just don't have these hill forts uh, and the walls collapse um, so no sorry apologies uh, most about 100, 100 BC a little bit more 400 BC uh, the hill forts start getting abandoned so you just wonder why, why at that point did they suddenly decide no more did the climate just get better and so you don't need to defend the land with a large defensive position we don't know but it's it's a really uh, really interesting one um, and so that's that's all I know Linda until they do more archaeology or I find a paper and I can read up about it those lowland forts are something I'm really keen to look at and maybe something I'd like to look at digging in the future when I, when I'm trained as an archaeologist um, recent video about Roman gods we have proof they were worshipped along Hadrian's Ball. Is there any proof they were worshipped in the south? Yeah, there's plenty. Loads. So, for instance, uh, Bath in the southwest of the country, um, they actually combine a native goddess, or what they think is a native goddess, with a, a Roman goddess. So you get Sulis Minerva. And there's a Bath was a, a spa location. And so the, the shrine of Sulis Minerva was a really big thing in the southwest. So the native gods were either paired with a Roman god or they were um, worshipped on their own or adopted by Romans. But we do know that there are hundreds, um, hundreds of, I'm happy to say hundreds, of native gods who were worshipped in the south. Uh, and there was sometimes also, you have Gallic and German gods who were also adopted and brought into. Uh, Hadrian's Wall is just obviously very heavily studied. And so you have a lot of evidence for Hadrian's Wall. How much of the wall is left? Hi Tika, by the way. Um, how much of the wall is left? Um, so there is probably... Um, it's a very good question. Because the thing is, it's how you measure it. Uh, the thing is itself is that the wall did collapse. So like when the wall collapsed, if you look in the image behind me, so just here, you can just see part of wall snaking along the top so after the Romans left obviously the wall collapsed a lot of it was recycled and as it was recycled it was just left on the ground but in the, um, the 17, uh, 1700s there was a local uh, lord in Northumberland who was called um, sorry landowner apologies called John Clayton and John Clayton what he did was he bought up all of the wall farms and when he bought up the wall farms he actually started rebuilding or reconstructing the wall and so when he reconstructed the wall he, um, he basically um, used modern concrete well modern concretes as in 18th century and 19th century concretes 
and he basically reconstructed large sections of the wall. And so when he reconstructed large sections of the wall, that's that's just like the, what we see today. Now, uh, the most excavated Roman fort is Bird Oswald Roman Fort, and 19% of the fort is excavated. So, um, or at least I believe that's correct. Housesteads has had extensive excavations, but um, at least under modern archaeology, I think 19% are Bird Oswald. So we still have so much more to learn about Hadrian's Wall, but actually when you look at it, um, I would say there's very little of the, well, there's none of the wall standing to its original height, but I don't know how much percentage-wise of the wall is left. The most famous sections are obviously the bits behind me in this picture. That's the bits that are most best known. Hmm. Um, did I get any weird looks while walking in full gear? Um, yeah, so I did actually, it's funny, because I actually went down to a local, there's a pub in not far from where this photo is taken, called Twice Brewed. Uh, if it's anywhere, it would be like, oh, one sec, sorry. Everything's reversed in the photo, so I have to figure it out. That way, there we go. Um, that way is Twice Brewed. It's a fantastic pub and I went there in my full kit and had lunch and uh, when I had uh, lunch at Twice Brewed, you know, they didn't even bat an eyelid. There was just a guy sat there in Roman armour and they were like, oh yeah, it's just a Wednesday, you know, sorry, it wasn't a Wednesday, it was a Thursday. But like, they were just like, oh yeah, are you okay, there's, um, there's a guy in Roman armour. Fair enough. And uh, I think they're quite used to people, you know, reenactors and stuff like that, dressing up, so they don't blink an eye. I did get one or two funny looks from other walkers who would have, um, who looked at me and were just like, oh, okay, and raised their eyebrows, but generally it was all good. Most people are really happy and they ask you questions. The bit I was most disappointed about was when I crossed uh, past a school in Cumbria. And uh, when I was passing this school in Cumbria, the kids suddenly started yelling, oh, you know, there's a Viking, there's a Viking. And I was just like, well, the education system failed you lot, didn't it? You know, can't recognize a Roman. Puh, what's going on here? Wasn't happy at all with that. But, you know, that's what happens. Um, do we know what Bird Oswald would have been called in Roman times? So, yeah, Bird Oswald is the Anglo-Saxon uh, name. Uh, but we think it would have probably been called Banner. B-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, Banner. Um, and one of the writers who I enjoy reading... Um, who is, um, one second, do I have his book to hand? Max Adams, a uh, really good author. I've mentioned him in the, uh, the Anglo-Saxon videos that I did, uh, the, the four-part series on Anglo who were the Anglo-Saxons. But Max Adams, he suggests that Banner could have been where St. Patrick was born. He, he doesn't think St. Patrick is Welsh, um, and he instead thinks that St. Patrick is, is Cumbrian or, um, would have been in that area of the world. Yeah, typical Viking armor. Ah, yeah, well, don't get into that with certain Viking reenactors. There's a big debate, well, about certain types of Viking armor, but yeah, yeah. The kids, they just saw me walk past and I was like, come on, kids, try harder. I'm not a Viking at all. It happens though. They get excited. They see someone in with weapons and armor going past, and they're like, "Ooh, Viking!" Oh <laughs> uh, well, I should have gone past and said, uh, "Hello, how are you all doing?" But I didn't. I was focused on getting getting along the wall. Um, just to give you all a heads up, and I know not everyone's here, but there's going to be a lot of Roman content this year. I was editing some videos, and when I was walking along Hadrian's Wall. I filmed with a 360 degree camera and when I filmed with a 360 degree camera I, um, I actually um, have edited those as much as possible and I've put them up and there's going to be content till August. Uh, every Wednesday will be my 360 degree day so you'll have 360 degree content coming out every Wednesday um, and that'll be an interesting one there. And Ryan, yeah, you are right. The Welsh were living in Cumbria, uh, but uh, there's the Strathclyde Britons in Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, so when I use the word Welsh, I'm referring to the modern-day country Wales. 
So there's the Britons, who are the Celtic inhabitants of the British Isles. And when you have the Celtic inhabitants, uh, they um, traditionally, the, the belief when you read the history books is they were pushed into the west of the country. And as they were pushed into the west of the country, they were then um, subjugated by the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, Cumbria actually gets its name from uh, the, the Brythonic or Old Welsh word uh, for citizen, Cum Cymru, uh, which is also, I believe, where the Welsh get their modern day name Cymru from, uh, which, because the Welsh don't refer to themselves as uh, Welsh, they refer to themselves as the Cymru, which is a corruption of the Latin word citizen, or well, from the Latin word citizen. So they, they still saw themselves as that. But uh, as I said earlier, the, the mixing between the natives and the Anglo-Saxons would have been far more apparent than people realise and would have continued for a lot longer. But uh, many people think that uh, St. Patrick was from Wales when Max Adams, the author, puts forward the argument instead he was from Cumbria from uh, Bird Oswald and that the Welsh, they were sort of the Irish when they're raiding. If you think of the British Isles, one second, I'll... Uh, just try and make this easier for everyone to see. Okay, yeah, that's that's a, a, an image of the British Isles. Don't don't get hung up on what's there on the picture, but that's the picture. So if you think here's Wales, and if you know St Patrick is there, you know you could come across and you could raid between the Irish Sea, whereas Max Adams thinks that the raiders could have come just straight across into Cumbria and to Bird Oswald up here and just taken St. Patrick and then uh, through the Solway uh, so if you see right here that's the Solway and they could have gone up the river quickly nabbed him and taken him across to be a slave in Ireland and then from there he then escapes from the south of Ireland across to France becomes a priest comes back and then sets up churches in Ireland that's a very uh, that's a new theory that he's putting forward. So um, I, I mean, I subscribe to it to an extent. I think it's a good theory, but as always, it just needs to be uh, more reading, more reading required. Um, I read there was a cavalry fort in Carlisle at the end of the war. Was there an equivalent in Newcastle side? Now, very good. So that yeah, the the one in Carlisle is. Um, Ulux, Uluxilium. Uh, one second. Please wait while I consult my notes. I struggle with the Latin, so. Ux, Uxlodunum, or uh, also called Petriana, uh, after the Alla Petriana which was the, um, the Alla Petriana is the, um, the cavalry unit station there. Now, across on the east coast, uh, at Wall's End, we have a unit, a mixed unit of infantry and cavalry, and that mixed unit of infantry and cavalry was um, the, uh, what were they called again? Quinta, Quinta Galora, no, Quinta Galora at Arbea. So in South Shields, we have a cavalry unit of, I think, um, 500 cavalrymen stationed in South Shields. The uh, Quinta Galora there. But the, yeah, there were the cavalry units all along the wall. Uh, the Alapetriana is a thousand strong unit of cavalry stationed in Carlisle. It's the largest cavalry unit in Britain. And so they think the commander of the Alapetriana was the commander of the wall. But uh, all along the wall, there's cavalry units. Uh, but there's no large unit to that size. Most of the units in the east are either infantry or mixed infantry and cavalry. Um, probably a uh, he was probably a picked Irish raider. Noah, uh, he's definitely not uh, a picked. Sorry to say that, Noah. We know this because from his own writings, he says how his grandfather was... Um, quite a high up Roman magistrate and his father was a vicar of the province. Uh, doesn't mean vicar as in like the modern day religious priest, but instead uh, like a local council leader. 
so we know he's a Roman citizen. He's not a Pict. Uh, the Picts were not uh, Roman citizens. I hope you don't mind me saying that. I'm not uh, just. It's something that's quite important about Saint Patrick when you're looking at him as a character. Uh, this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I will auto ignore the autocorrect class. Uh, Scott scales invaded Pictlands more than Wales. Well, actually, we actually see that the Irish uh, did actually in the fourth, fifth, and sixth century settle in northern and western Wales. Uh, we know this because we see tombs with Ogram on, and Ogram is the Irish language. So, uh, whereas the uh, Germanic Anglo-Saxons use runes. Ogram is like a single line and then you do lines either above or below the line to create your letters. And we found tombs with Ogram on in North and South Wales. So there was actually an Irish migration into Wales in the 4th, uh, 5th, 6th centuries. And it may have been that the Welsh, to supplement their forces, were hiring Irish um, fighters just as much as the the uh, Romano Britons were hiring Germanic forces on the East Coast. Really interesting one there. And so, yeah, definitely uh, have a look into Irish Ogram in Wales uh, during the early the early Middle Ages. Um, hey, welcome, Odric. Is that Odric? Welcome from Leicestershire. Ah, class. It's been a while since I've been down to Leicester, actually. Uh, my wife has friends there. I love visiting, actually. Really good fun. Uh, Linda, haven't seen your war walk videos. We'll watch tonight. Do you know anything about the beginning of London after Romans abandoned it? Um, again, not really. I need to look a lot more into it. It seems that London was more abandoned. Um, Anglo-Saxon London is slightly further up the river if I'm right, but unfortunately my knowledge of um, those areas in the south is not as strong as up here. I need to do more reading, um, but there seems to have been like warehouses that were still in operation. There seems to be an, uh, an entrepreneurial spirit by a few merchants to keep things going in the area, but it doesn't seem to be anywhere half as populated as before. There's current theories, mainly because of COVID at the minute, that there may have been a plague and that uh, Britain was affected and maybe one of the reasons uh, why you know that um, we see urban areas getting abandoned so heavily was because the population was reduced substantially um, some people put forward the argument the plague of Justin Tinian maybe have got right into the British Isles as well so we, we just don't know it's one of those big question marks um, but I, I do suggest um, Max Adams the last kingdom uh, so not the last kingdom the first kingdoms as a good source uh, and in the Age of Giants both by Max Adams very easy to access he talks about the south and the southeast and London in his books um, but I'll, I'll maybe look into that a wee bit more because London is an interesting one and obviously people find it a very interesting topic um, but so uh, yeah no I'm aware of the presence of just it's cool uh, sorry I had to break in this question Alfred the Great told his people to stay in the ruins to avoid Viking invasion. Um, there's some really interesting stuff actually about the uh, the ruins because um, I was speaking to a friend of mine who does Viking reenactment and the evidence suggests that a lot of the early medieval or dark age material that we see of gold, silver, bronze, stuff like that, it's recycled. So it seems that what they were doing was they were digging through um, old Roman settlements uh, especially late Roman settlements and they were just smelting they were setting up smelting works and they were just taking all of the old bronze and gold and silver and then using it to cast their new stuff so when I said about the entrepreneurial guy in London he's probably going through all the old houses opening up locked boxes of places where people have you know left stuff or you know, left hurriedly and he's taking it and then smelting it down to make into new stuff or to sell so really cool like sort of thing but it's you know like all archaeology or history you we think about what did we lose you know what was lost what do we not know about you know that we could have you know found had it not been smelted down and turned into um to uh to anything else and by the way sorry i didn't say hello linda at the start but great to have you with us 
Uh, yeah, it'd be really nice to have you visit, Linda. Like I, again, if, if if I've opened up another part of history or another part of the world to you, even better. Thank you as well, just for showing interest, and it's class. And welcome to all the people who are watching currently. I've noticed the numbers gone up a wee bit, so class to have you with us. Yeah. But um, yeah, there was loads, loads of things that like I've learned lately, and like the idea of the, you know, the the Anglo-Saxons or the you know people like that smelting down old Roman um, goods um, is really interesting. You know, would would they have valued coins in the same way that we do? Would they have just seen a coin and gone, well, actually, that's more valuable if I take you know thirty coins, melt them down, and I have a bar of silver? Is that more valuable? So were, were they just taking the, you know, when we think of, you know, the last coins coming into the British Isles and, you know, the four, um, 407, 408, I think, 407, 408 AD, you know, would, were there actually more coins coming in later? Was the, the continuation of Roman Britain um, longer than we've given credit for? But actually, you know, the, the recycling job of the Anglo-Saxons was just so efficient that means that we only have stuff from the early 4th, 3rd, 2nd and 1st century. Um, again, I have nothing archaeological or historical to back that up, but I, I like pointing it out and it's a, a, a nice little thing to think about um, if, you, if you're interested. Ah, I didn't know you were based down there. I do want to visit the United States one day. Uh, my wife has warned me I would not like I like I kind of want to see Boston but I kind of don't she says that the revolutionary trail would uh, would set me off like anything um, and uh, I would really struggle to not I'd get arrested basically probably for being like yeah anyway I won't I won't say stuff but uh, I, I know I'd maybe struggle with the, uh, the revolutionary trail let's just put it that much Oh, thank you, Ryan. Um, I hope it's... Uh, you see, that's that's the thing. We don't know. Until we find evidence... Like, let's say we found, like, a place where we found evidence of metalworking with, recyc like, with recycled Roman coins and also produced new material, that's when we get to make a theory. Until then, it's only hot air. And the problem is, if I talk... Like, if people talk too much and don't evidence stuff then that's a problem. Um, I, I was sent a book by a friend and I read it and um, I was, it was really frustrated me because he's, he basically made history up and it's, it's a, the, the, the author had made history up. They'd, they'd basically said, oh well, I think this happened and then wrote it as history and they'd based stuff off the idea of King Arthur and they'd used some very unreliable genetic histories and haleographies and all of that sort of stuff and you're like come on you th this there's no evidence for what you're saying but you've built this just because it's something you're passionate about and we have to always be so careful like when we're studying like do we have evidence we can put forward hypotheses we can we can theorize but we have to be so careful because otherwise that's how you create mythology and like that, that's that's annoying because it stops the study of history being as interesting for other people. Hmm. Ah, I'll have to look at where Arkansas is. I, I mean, my American geography. People find it funny, but my American geography, I'm slowly getting better, but I'm not as strong as I'd like to be. I'd love to study more. I'd love to look into it more, but I'm still still learning. As in, like, I can figure out most of the major areas. I figure out the difference between east, the west, the south. Um, you know, you've got east coast, the south, the west. Uh, below the south, you've got Texas. Um, that's basically as I understand it. And then in the north, you've got Utah and, like, Canada. Ah, that's the one. St. Robert of Orkney. Yes. Thank you, Odric. That is brilliant. That's the one I'm talking about. The really uh, weird, um, brilliant Scandinavian king who basically just went, 
what's the highest thing you can be as a Christian? A saint. Oh, well, I'm a saint now. Really interesting character. Arkansas. Have a look, basically, mate. If I'm wrecking the pronunciation of the state, then, to be honest, it makes up for every single time when I have to hear Americans come over and say, we would love to go to Bamberg. Can you take us to Bamberg? Uh, oh, Edinburgh. Oh, I love Edinburgh. It's such a wonderful place. Yeah, Edinburgh, you mean, or, or Bam Bambra. Yeah, 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 they're, they're lovely, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, ha can you, can we go from Edinburgh to Bamberg in half an hour? No, no, you can't. <laughs> sorry, I love them. Arkansas, sorry. Arkansas. Ah, yeah. I'm also dyslexic, so I, I'm also working from a screen this far away. So, yeah, that's my, my excuse. If I butchered it, I'm very sorry. I Don't worry, no. I, I hope I'm not being harsh. I'm really not meaning to be harsh. I'm just making a joke. Hmm. Aye. Nah. Any plans on visiting Car from Battle? Yes! That's one of the ones I want to do. When I do the Anglo Scottish border, I really want to go to the battle site of Carfam. Uh, one of my friends was actually involved in the 20, 2018 reenactment battle. Uh, where they did the reenactment of the um, the fight that decided the border, and uh, the real Uhtred of Bambra uh, is is his he died beforehand, but his brother we think led the troops at the Battle of Carfam, which basically resulted in the border between England and Scotland to the modern age. So it's such an important site, and I want to go there, and I want to do some filming there. It's on the list of places which I need to sit down, plan out some filming. And I think I might do like two or three days of intense filming where I'll do like castles, border reavers, Anglo-Scottish wars, and then make, you know, good 20, 30 odd videos if I can, uh, and then come home and edit them. And we'll see. Um, I'd love to have some feedback. Some Tomorrow I'm releasing some f uh, 360 content. If you do watch it, please tell me what you think. If you don't, um, if you don't like it, tell me and I'll try not to do it, but I'm doing a little bit more 360 content in the future and it would be really interesting to, uh, to have a look at it. Uh, yeah, Geography of Pronunciations. I have a huge interest in late antiquity, early medieval. That's why I started watching it. Roman period is very interesting too. Thanks, now it's true. Uh, jokingly hate each other, Brits and Americans, for cutting me enough each other. If someone talks and pronounces something. I don't think hate is the right word. I think it's like, you know, we both sort of grudgingly accept each other in a, in a, in a good way. And it's just like, you know, we, we sort of have a shared history, but it's a, it's a weird one. And I don't think there's any bad, there's no bad blood on my side, at least. And American customers are some of the loveliest people I have on tours. Um, and I really enjoy having American customers because you've just got such a passion for history and you want to see. And so um, I've actually got some some Americans next week at the end on Friday I'm taking a group of Americans on to Hadrian's Wall and then I've got uh, an American travel agent who's visiting and we're going to Bamber and Hadrian's Wall again and then I've just got load like stuff's really coming in and that's nice which also at the same time means filming is a wee bit of a pressure because I'm trying to get out and do the filming and the research to make sure that I'm saying the right things doing good content and getting it filmed well in a certain amount of time and uh, I'm feeling the pressure, but I will do it for you guys. And um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm gonna try and put some stuff together. If you forgive, at the end of the month, um, I'm going to probably have to, at the start of April, have some more sitting at my desk content and some more film stuff from my desk. Um, just because it will give me the time to get out and film at the end of the month. Uh, and then hopefully create the additional content, but I'm really trying to <clears throat> to figure out how best to do that so I can get up and do some stuff. Maybe I might be able to do some stuff uh, in more in March and uh, get away and do some stuff probably second or third week of March uh, to do some more filming. 
poco sí. Uh, oh yeah, the, the Origins of Xmas was, was so Christmas was great fun. Um, but again, like it's I wouldn't ever say that uh, Saguenalia was Christmas. Some people do, but I don't. And then I like doing the, the midwinter festivals for the pagans. That again, it really surprises me which videos take off and which don't. Um, sometimes videos that I've put my heart and soul into and absolutely love just flop and then videos that I just produce and go oh I don't really enjoy doing that one just take off it's so funny but at the same time it's just it's just great because you just see what happens and it's, it's good fun um, what kind of written records are kept about the Roman soldiers who served around Hadrian's Wall if any uh, hello Baba uh, Baba June um, Basically, the, the only record, written records that are first hand are from Vindalanda, uh, Vindalanda Roman Fort, and I should be doing some filming there soon. Um, the, the written records are first hand accounts, and they're kind of like Roman post it notes. So, what the Romans did is they'd have a wee little piece uh, of card, sorry, a little slip of wood, and they would write either in, on ink on it. And then when you finished, you would break it in half and then tie it together. And then you would write the name and the address of the person you're sending it to on the back. And then it would be delivered. And we think the Roman army wrote in triplicate. So one would be sent to the individual, one would be kept at the records of the fort, and one would be sent to the original headquarters. So when you have these wee cards, at Vindolanda, what happens is, is that Romania... Uh, Roman Romania, Dacia, revolts. When it revolts, they pull troops off the northern frontier of Britain and the unit of Vindolanda gets posted to Romania. I think it's the 8th cohort of Tungrians, if I remember, or is it the 8th cohort of Batavians? Again, I'm really sorry, I'm working off memory. There's a lot of stuff in here, so if I've said something wrong, forgive me, please. But um, they get posted to Romania and they never come back. But because they have to now march from Britain to Romania, they can't take all their stuff with them. So what they do is, it seems every soldier has more than one pair of boots. They have bath clogs for when they go to the bathhouse. They have sandals. They chuck them into pits or fires. They chuck all of their. They start burning all of the camp records. Everything they can't take, they either scrap it and burn it, or chuck it into a pit. And then from there. They just march off, and when they march off, they never come back. But it seems that when they're burning the camp records, there's a gigantic pit with all of these records on it. And when they have this gigantic pit, when they leave, um, an afternoon rain, uh, com uh, rain comes in. And when this an afternoon rain comes in, um, sorry, yeah, just had a question come in. Um, when the afternoon rain comes in, it puts out the fire. And so this preserves a load of these Roman post-it notes. And some of them are orders, some of them are unit rosters, some of them are letters. They have the first ever woman's handwriting from, uh, I think, the British Isles uh, and possibly the Western Roman Empire. Uh, and it's the commanding officer's wife inviting another commanding officer's wife to her birthday party. Uh, we have medical reports, we have um, like report uh, orders for goods to come to the fort, and it's all first hand. Uh, they found similar ones from Roman London. The one that comes to my mind the most from Roman London is a, um, a, a purchase of a slave, a female slave was purchased, and she was bought for a large sum of money, a really large sum of money. Uh, then we also, which is it's tragic when you have something like that, historical records of someone basically being bought and sold. It's really horrible. Um, then alongside that as well, they've also got records from Roman Carlisle too uh, that have come out of the ground. But I don't know what they was written on it. I can't remember off the top of my head. But these little Roman wooden boards from Vindolanda, they are from around about 70 to 80 AD. And they give us a nice picture of what was going on at that time but we don't have as many records from the later period other than altar stones and stuff like that. They just don't get preserved as well. But the next unit who came along just built right on top of the old fort and just covered it in clay, 
covered it over and they were preserved and so they are underneath ground at Vindolanda and they find a load of really interesting stuff there. Um, etymology of Easter. Um, I'm not sure of that one, Ryan. So there is Yosta, and Bede mentions Yosta as being a pagan goddess at that time of year. So it may have been that because the month or the time of year was named after her, they, they used that for the name for Easter. But the festival itself is not connected. The festival is definitely from the Christian uh, Catholic or uh, Christian tradition uh, that you have the festival. Yosta only gave her name to the time of year and to the, the festival itself. If you look in all other languages, it's a different word. But I can't remember. Um, ba -ba -da -ba -ba. Yosta, yeah. You're welcome. I hope I've answered something, but yeah, definitely. Vindolando Roman Fort, one sec. They, their blog is really good too. Um, I'll be visiting there next Friday. Um, there you go, Vindolanda. Have a look at their blogs. They've got some really interesting blogs. And for some reason, um, they've got anaerobic conditions. So oxygen hasn't been able to get a lot of the finds. So they've still got a load of wood and uh, cloth and leather that's just been pulled out of the ground. It's really, really good. Really, really cool what they're discovering there. Mm. Yeah, definitely a good one there. Mm. Oh yeah, 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 definitely, Ryan. I agree. Same time of year. I do apologize. I'm trying to read these um, these notes from a bit of a distance, and sometimes when they're coming in, I'm speaking for a while and looking back, quickly trying to read it and then come back, which is where we get the, uh, you know, Arkans. Arkansas, Arkansas issue from, you know, as previously stated. Uh, um, I'm trying to think of any other questions, if I've, if I've missed any or if I've uh, of anything like that, or if anyone has any. Still good to have like a few people with us. I've been amazed, by the way, at how fast the channel has grown since January. So obviously early January we hit 1,000. Uh, I think we're on 1,220 as of today. So if any new people have joined in the last two months, thank you so much, but it's just been amazing. <clears throat> hmm. Do I personally celebrate Easter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Easter is my most important festival of the year. Uh, the other war features, i.e. the ditches, Valum, and the military zone are fascinating as the war itself. Yes. Now, Odric, um, the, the Valum, so it's funny, the Valum, we get the word from Bede as well. So Bede called it a Valum, but a Valum actually is a word for a, um, it's the word for a wall. But actually the correct word, the Latin word would be fossa or a ditch. So um, the, the ditch, uh, the Valum behind and before, so you have a ditch in front, the how, how Hadrian's Wall works is you have a ditch, then you have a small mound, then the wall itself, then behind the wall you have a distance of, I think it's around about 100 meters. Then you have um, the vallum or the ditch the, behind it, but the, then the material from that was then piled up on either side to create two mounds. And I think how it worked was the mounds were about three meters high or two meters high. So you would have, you'd run along, you'd have a two to three meter high mound you had to get up. Then because of the drop, because of the mound, there's a six meter deep ditch. And so you drop down and then you have to get up the other side. But at the bottom of the ditch, they had a packed earth level, um, which and the, the angle of it was that you couldn't stop. So you'd hit the bottom of that and it was an ankle breaker. And so you'd be stuck at the bottom of the ditch. Um, or it's just very hard to pass it. And then finally, you would have it on the other side. But the vallum was basically to protect the wall from the south because the locals, the locals aren't Roman friendly. They, they, they would just as much attack the wall because it's going right through your land. 
It's like someone builds like something like the Berlin Wall right through your garden or like cuts you off from your cousin down the road. It's it, the, people don't get that element of it. They think the Britons are all okay about Hadrian's Wall. Not really. Uh, we see that they, every sort of 50 to 80 years Britain revolts, uh, especially the north. And so that's why we see people like, you know, after Hadrian's death, after the death of Antonius Pius, it seems in the 60s and 70s and 80s, there was a, well, it was possibly in the 70s or 80s a revolt. And then uh, Carac, what, who was it? It was, um, give me a second, I'm having to remember the names of the emperors off the top of my head. So Commodus then has to hair tail it to Britain, uh, well sends a um, so sends a military delegation, and then there's a war in Britain seemingly around about the um, the eighties, um, and then after Commodus, you have in um, two hundred and eight to two hundred and eleven Septim Septimius Severus and um, Cara, uh, Septi and his son Caracalla and Geta fighting in Britain. And then after them, there's a long period of peace because they committed genocide in the British Isles. Uh, and then it is uh, Constantinus Chlorus in the two, 290s does a campaign up in Northern Britain. Then obviously Constantine the Great is proclaimed emperor in York in, two, in, six, uh, in uh, the 306, yeah. And then um, in late Roman Britain, we have definite evidence of campaigns as well. Or there's the Barbarian Conspiracy in 367. 367, 368, the Great Barbarian Conspiracy. So, you know, that's, that's a very interesting one as well. When you're looking at it, there's Britain didn't stay, you know, like a, a peaceful province. It was constantly rebelling and constantly fighting. But it was economically viable because the East Coast was a grain basket the west coast had tin gold lead silver you know there was uh, slaves dogs grain food very very wealthy province very useful province even though it's a a very difficult province i once stayed in a bnb at greenhead which is quite literally on the wall yeah i walked through there recently and uh, was it um uh bushnook bnb bushnook bnb is class i've stayed there a couple of times if you ever walk in the wall definitely pay them a visit they are um, really good and their breakfast is very 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 good uh, they've looked after me in the past and I very much always shout their praises but yeah bush nooks um, shameless plug shameless plug for them but if you're ever walking Hadrian's Wall that's a place to stay in Cumbria or in the west mm. Mm. just a, a I know there's only a small group of us here but that doesn't mean you know quant uh, quality not quantity but uh, are you interested in seeing more stuff in reenactment gear or was that just something a wee bit geeky that you thought was fun, but you weren't too bothered about? Is that, you know, what's your opinion on that? Is it something you would want to see again or not? Mm -hmm. Sorry, just watching chat to see uh, when your messages pop up. Pardon me. funny because I can see I've got my window open here so I'm watching uh, my own stream just to see the distance and um, just seeing my own mouth move is quite a funny one because I'm thinking a lot about you know like future content 
And if it was something you really enjoyed and you'd like more sort of like, yeah. Okay, so Ryan, you're up for it. But if other people just think it's like not useful or anything like that, just say because um, it's just an interesting one. At the moment, my kit is heavily weighted towards Anglo-Saxon, but uh, I might, sorry, or towards Roman, but I'm interested in doing some Anglo-Saxon, might get a Viking kit up and running again, and then it's just, just see what happens. I don't have anything in particular in mind, actually. It's, um, it's just as and when. Um, I might do some work with Newcastle's Castle in the future, or a beat, a, a, what's, what was Bede's World, but um, I've been talking to them, Jarrah Hall, they've got some Anglo-Saxon stuff. It's just, it's, it's of interest to me, and Ad Geffren, there's now a whiskey distillery being built in Wooler near the Ad Geffren site, so the videos I'm doing uh, about Ad Geffren uh, sort of tie into this, but they're also doing an Anglo-Saxon visitor centre, um, so that would be really, really interesting, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> Glad to see you were wowed by it. Uh, Wednesday is going to be... I'm, I'm interested to see how the Wednesday videos will go, but um, let's see. Uh, there we go. So yeah, a whiskey distillery is being put just nearby the Ang Anglo-Saxon capital um, of Northumbria. So the current videos that are going out about Ad Geffren, um, those are also... Um, and the whiskey distillery up there, they're doing some visitor centre work as well, so that'll be really interesting. Um, so yeah, more Anglo-Saxon people are keen for. Linda's not certain, but we'll, we'll that's all good. Um, but yeah, I'll just, I'll just try it out as and when. It, it'll be interesting to see what works, because obviously I, I try and get feedback back. I try and use the community tab to talk to people. But obviously when you've got like 1,200 people, you know, you get a core group of people, and you guys here are obviously quite a lot of that core. I think there's about 30, 40 of you who regularly comment, who regularly chat to me. I know you like you, what you like, what you dislike, your opinions, stuff like that. It's really cool. But obviously, it's trying to figure out what the other <clears throat> 1,160 want. And, uh, you know, they're the silent minority, so I'm, I'm just trying to figure them out too. And hopefully I won't scare them off. Hopefully they'll just keep growing. People will join the channel and we'll just see how it happens. Yeah, have a look, Ryan. It's it's an interesting one. I want to go and try their whiskey as well. The only problem is when I drink whiskey, it's, I get very depressed. Um, I've noticed it as as I've got into my into my early thirties now. Um, but uh, when I was in my sort of late twenties, I tried whiskey a couple of times and I just got so depressed and I just didn't know why. But uh, yeah, whiskey depresses me for some weird reason. Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to try and put something together on the board of Reavers. Uh, I'll write that down now so I don't forget. But yeah. So yeah, Anglo-Scottish border. And also uh, castles. And some more Anglo-Saxon because those all seem to do well. Um, but also, just because I'm interested in them, um, there will be a little bit more Roman stuff coming just because there's the Hadrian's Wall 1900. But I'm just going to see how it goes, and I'll be interested to know as well. Like when I release the 360 stuff every Wednesday at nine o'clock, I'm going to be releasing some 360 videos, but I'm not going to be pushing them on Facebook or anything else. So I'm just interested to see how people think of them, or if they people enjoy them, or if they're just, you know, you know, just just tell me what you think, especially with the stuff that comes out tomorrow. Have a look at it if you like, and then just give us feedback because, you know, I don't want to overwhelm people with it, but I'd like to see if people enjoy the 360 content of like, just I don't talk in it, I just walk along with the GoPro, and you can see the landscape. So it's kind of like a, a walk along, but without any content, I uh, like speaking. Um, so I just like to know what people think. <laughs> what did you miss? Um, I, I don't know if how I can catch you up quickly, mate. Uh, there's been quite a few uh, few things chatting. Um, I'm 
just been I've been basically seeking seeking advice from the crowd, finding out what people's opinions are, what people want to watch, what people don't want to watch, um, you know, stuff like that. Figuring those sort of bits and bobs out. Uh, if people want to see some more stuff in reenactment gear, if people have a particular preference, looking at stuff like obviously the border reavers, Anglo-Scottish border castles, Anglo-Saxon. Those are my projects I want to work on for the like getting more content out. But I just need to find time to, to film and to get out and do it. Uh, but I think it'll be, um, yeah, it's going to be possible. It's going to be definitely something I'm going to be doing. I definitely doing gin as well. There's no waiting to mature. Yeah, gin can be produced overnight in a bathtub. It's hilarious. Um, it, I, I, I am uh, less of a fan of gin, but uh, it's a funny one nevertheless. But there is definitely like uh, that opportunity too. Mm. So um, yeah, that's the the interesting stuff kind of for me is to try and figure out how to produce the best content and keep going forward. So I'm always trying to learn. I'm hoping that this stream, uh, the quality is good enough for you guys um, and that you're happy with it. Um, I'm looking at the screen as well and it seems to be quite good. Um, and hopefully you know, it's, it's good enough quality. Um, again, I'm, I'm having a chat with a couple of people to try and improve my office, to improve streaming, recording quality, and to improve the, the quality of the work that I'm gonna be putting out. Because alongside tours, I think this is gonna be a big part of my business going forwards, and I really enjoy it. So kind of just getting feedback in the comments section and also doing these monthly and just watching them grow is just beneficial. Sometimes, you know, the feeling of each one is gonna be different depending on who turns up, but I'm just enjoying it nevertheless. Yeah, so um, Beads World. It used to be called Beads World, um, but uh, then it went under. It went, uh, it closed. So now it's called Jarrah Hall, and um, I'm trying to talk to some of the people there about doing some filming. I'm also trying to talk to Durham Cathedral um, to do some filming at Durham Cathedral, but it's a very, very big machine to talk to, and it takes a long, long time to actually try and... Um, put over the, 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 the benefit to large organizations, um, especially when sometimes they'll go, oh, you've only got a thousand subscribers, and you go, well, actually, you know, there's, you know, there's the thousand subscribers who are subscribed, but there's also the people who watch and the benefit to you, and the fact that these videos will exist for a lot longer than the time that they're watched. And the large organizations, they take a lot longer, and if they're more traditional, they don't understand the benefit of new technologies. So I will get there. But it takes it takes a while, and sometimes I just have to go, make a journey down, sit down in front of them, and go. This is what I can do for you guys if you're interested. But we'll get there. Odric, Roman glass cut, or cut. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So the the stuff in uh, Repton is very interesting because Repton was huge for the Scandinavians. One of the ones I'm interested up here. Is there seems to be an overnight camp in the in the uh, the Cheviots where the the great the great heathen host seems to have stayed before they went and attacked Dalratia and uh, the west coast of Scotland and the kingdom of Strathclyde. So I'm very interested to look into that. But uh, recycling of Roman glass, recycling of Roman materials, does seem to be a really big thing, and it happens over and over again. I have a feeling, Odric, are you watching this? A slightly later and then catching up. I don't know if you're cu you're at the same time as us, but that's a, another one. Yeah, church. Uh, there's there is more of a push towards larger churches being seen, uh, Noah, as a um, as visitor attractions rather than religious buildings. But it just depends. Um, 
some some cathedrals choose to go down the tourism route because of the cost of keeping a cathedral open they're hugely expensive but it just it just depends on the building really depends on the building and how it looks and that sort of stuff there yeah yeah i thought the same ryan but um it's cool i like i like seeing his little things pop up i hope he doesn't think i'm being rude and ignoring him by not speaking back <laughs> i really hope he doesn't that that would be um that would just be yeah but that's that's fine i'm sure he's, he's figured it out or at least if he watches up to now he'll suddenly go wait a second they're not talking about roman glass anymore Ah, uh, yeah, so one of the ones on my list will be Eskom when I finally get round to it. So, again, always remember that I've got a huge backlog of production. But Eskom. Eskom Church. Um, yeah, so this one here, Eskom Church. Uh, will be the one I really, really like to um, to visit. Yeah, yeah, uh, and do some on because uh, the one of the famous things is they've got a little window in Eskom Church, and it's actually a recycled Roman stone toilet seat. So they just found this perfectly circular st uh, stone that the Romans had used as a toilet seat, and they recycled it for a stained glass window. I think that is brilliant. You know, that's, you know, like people would go and laugh and like this sort of poke fun and go, oh, you know, they use a toilet seat, ha ha. No, they were really clever. They found an exact fit and they used it for a stained glass window. You know, it's so, you know, it's hard quarrying stone and shaping it. They just found something that was ready made and went for it. That's, that's brilliant. I love it. That's the sort of stuff that I think um, people don't take into account. They sometimes go and say, oh, it's vandalism, it's destruction, it's all of this. And I'm like, no, no, this is really clever. It's, it's recycling materials, making your life easier. And, you know, it's, it's good. It's, it's the way history is built. And it's the way that we, you know, we're still recycling stuff now. And it's, it's kind of interesting. Hmm. I don't mind Noah. Um, I'll, I'm quite, I'm open about my faith, but uh, at the same time, I'm always aware that it's like some people may not be as comfortable as others. So don't don't bother, don't worry. I'm not going to suddenly cut, crack down on the uh, the chat. You ask the questions you want to ask. Um, so no bother whatsoever for me. And um, again, if other people want to talk about other stuff, um, you know, I have. Uh, a couple of people who I know who are practicing um, sort of pagan uh, pagans or they would call themselves Norse pagans I mean um, one of uh, my former accountant uh, was a Norse pagan uh, so is a Norse pagan lovely lad really really amazing guy and he's you know he sometimes comments on stuff on Facebook and we get on really well and I have no problem I, I have my own personal belief as to how the universe is and you know it's god's role in the universe whereas other people have their view and you know i don't have a problem with that it's a personal faith um and so i, I hope people feel comfortable in the comments and in the videos and in the way that i put forward history um and i want people to be able to access what i'm creating and feel enjoy it in a, in a good way um so i hope that's the case of what people feel when they're in it uh Yeah, yeah. Um, so in there's also uh, Linda as well. There's uh, Anglo-Saxon churches. There's one in Sunderland as well, St. Peter's. There's parts of St. Paul's in Jarrow. It's got Anglo-Saxon foundations. Uh, Eskom is probably the one I think is the most complete Anglo-Saxon church. Uh, Hexham Abbey has an Anglo-Saxon crypt, but is mostly... 19th or 20th century if I'm correct um, then there's a few medieval churches quite a few Norman churches but I don't know of many other Anglo-Saxon churches uh, obviously the church on Lindisfarne is definitely not the original one um, nor is the one on Iona 
on the west. Uh, but uh, I'll just try and think as I go and just I'll, I'll try and I'll try and do some filming um, and try and put on the list of stuff to look at for Eskom and Anglo-Saxon churches. Durham. It's on the list. But it may be months before you see a produced video, so please just be patient with me. I do promise this, when I write stuff down, I do my hardest to produce it. But at the same time, there is, like when you see a video, it could have been produced up to two months ago. And that's for some of them. If I create a backlog, it may be three or four months before you see what I create. Um, and that's just the, the way that I can balance my personal life, my business, my work, all of this together. Um, yeah, it's sort of, yeah, it's it's just the easiest way because it means I get to see my family, my little one, uh, my, you know, do my business as well, my tours and all of that. Um, whereas I know some people who are on YouTube, they produce it on the day or on weekly or every two to three days they make a video and it's all very current. Whereas when you watch my stuff, it's like, you know, you can tell when the live streams because if you track my facial hair and my where when I've had a haircut, then you can tell how long it's been since I lasted a, a you know a film probably. <laughs> That's probably the best way of thinking about it. <laughs> I will hold you to that. Da da da. <laughs> Scary biscuits. Scary biscuits. Um. Normally I try and keep these to about two hours long. So we've got about five minutes left um, of the stream. So if you've got any last minute questions or stuff like that, please do. And I will, uh, I will try and keep myself uh, serious. <laughs> Great facial hair. It took, um, it took a number of years to build, uh, to grow. Um, took a number of years to grow, I promise you that. Yeah, thanks Ryan. Um, yeah, no, as always, um, if, if you should have a link to either my website or to my um, social medias and stuff like that. So if you want to drop me any messages on either Facebook or YouTube or anything like that, or send me an email, I'm happy to answer questions when I get the chance or point you in the direction of information I know. So happy to do that. So just please keep asking questions because I like building up more of a rapport, more of a stuff like that. Mm hmm. Hmm. Any more for any more? Um. So building wise, um, I've got two. So um, so Noah, for anyone who can't see the chat, has just asked, "What's my favorite church?" So I love Durham Cathedral for its grand Romanesque architecture and it's it's so, so grand and beautiful and the way the light comes through the stained glass windows and hits the golden sandstone and I, I could wax lyrical about it. But I also like St. Nicholas's Church in Newcastle, the Cathedral of Newcastle. And the reason why is I got married there and I love St. Nicholas's and um, they've recently refurbished it so it's a different interior to how it was when I got married but I still like what they've done and I've, I've worked with that church in the past and uh, they, they're good but I, I wanted to get married in the cathedral of my city and it was a, it's a lovely choice, really good one there. Um, oh you have Facebook, I'm bad, 15 day block I'd message you. I know a lot of people who have been thrown into the uh, Facebook gale, uh, jail recently actually uh, yeah, Zucht, as I believe people call it. Uh, yeah, but if you look for Alex Isles UK, that's the YouTube channel's one, or if you search for Isles Tours, so... Yeah, that's my business. Uh, so there's a business Facebook page, and there's I Alex Isles UK, which is the YouTube one. But that's now. Safe journeys, Ryan, and thank you for coming. Uh, yeah, you're welcome, Baba June. More than welcome. Uh... Yeah, if if you uh, it's always able, I think churches are willing. They're very happy to do marriages. Uh, anyone, to, any way to get people through the doors, they say. But yeah, that's the case. 
So from where I'm sat, there's two minutes left, but I know there's probably a 10 to 15 second delay, so I'll hold on for a wee bit. But if you've got your questions, throw them in, and uh, yeah, I just look forward to hearing any questions anyone has. bother. Mm. Any more questions? Don't worry if not. It's the final countdown. Class. Well, I'll just summarize it. As always, uh, for anyone who's watching this back afterwards, thank you so much for watching. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting to everyone live as well, but I really hope that you've enjoyed the stream, that I've been able to tell you something about history, share things, um, and at the same time as well, I really hope that people have like um, basically just learned something. But also, if you've got any questions, as I've said in the stream, Please feel free to message me from the Facebook page for the YouTube channel, which is Alex Isles UK, or you can also message me at alex at Isles, I -L -E -S, tours .co uk. But as always, please do like and subscribe, share the videos with your friends, and just help the channel grow, because I'm going to be continuing to do this. I'm loving it. It's really great fun, and uh, basically doing that. I've just seen the question, what's my favorite song? It keeps changing. I don't have a particularly favorite song, but... Uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I am musical, I love listening to music, but I am not musical in myself. But seeing as that was the final question, I'll just put the uh, ending screen on, give it 30 seconds and then end the stream. But it's been an absolute pleasure everyone, and I hope to see you all in the near future. Thank you very much and goodbye.